Good afternoon and welcome back to another Hakum webinar. I'm Stefan Komonik, co-founder and managing partner at Hakum Time Series. Please note that all our webinars are recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. You will receive a direct link along with a follow-up email right afterwards. There you'll find a lot more useful information following our principle, life is a time series. A new tech era has begun and of course with it new tech trends are emerging and some old ones are getting the attention that they now deserve. The concept of digital twins emerged back in the 1960s already, but the term was coined far later on and has become real popular especially in recent years. Now that we have ever increasing computational power, we gain the ability to mesh data in the cloud and analyze it using AI. And this makes digital twins a game changer and consequently the topic of our webinar. Therefore today we will talk about what a digital twin is, where it is applied and of course why time series are a fundamental part. And finally we present a very exciting use case in rail transport. With us is Florian Stark, sales and business development expert at Industrial Analytics, an organization that recently became part of the Infineon Group. They are an innovative startup within the industrial power control division that is based in Berlin. Let me also introduce Anastasia Langer, senior researcher in the R&D team at Hacom Time Series. The three of us will now discuss the digital twin concept and how it is applied in today's energy industry and other verticals. So let's start and meet the panelists. So hi everybody and welcome to our next Hakum webinar. A warm welcome especially to our speakers Anastasia in Munich Anastasia and Florian in Berlin. Hi. Um, and once again uh, we are really overwhelmed by the positive feedback we got and uh, that so many of you join us. Uh, we are about to exceed uh, the 250 participants right now so that's really motivating for us. Um, and as always, again, I'd uh, ask you to get in touch with us also during the webinar. Please use the Q&A function because uh, at the end we will have this Q&A session. And as usually, we want to answer all of your questions. So please challenge us. And this time uh, we even got some questions in advance and we will certainly answer them later on. So all of you, please stay tuned. This time we will talk about the digital twins and in my intro I'd like to start with my first computer. You can see it now. It's the one and only Commodore 64 and it was back in 83, that is 1983, and it had very advanced features for that time. Now those features included basic programming and I programmed a tiny little helicopter that you could navigate uh, using the keyboard trying not to collide with any obstacles on the screen. <laughs> well, commercially it was not a big success. But today I know that I created a digital twin because it was a digital repre representation of a physical asset. And now, exactly, almost exactly 40 years later, we'll talk about a lot more sophisticated applications of that concept. And therefore, I ask Anastasia to give us an introduction to digital twins and tell us uh, how uh, they are built and why they are much more useful than my little video game. Anastasia. Thank you, Stefan. Digital twin is a term which is used to describe the digital representation of processes, products, or services. There is some debate in the literature on the term's origin and its correct definition. Most commonly, the first appearance of the term is attributed to the technical report, which was published by NASA in 2010. But semantically similar concepts have been around already before that. For instance, a similar concept of virtual manufacturing as advanced modeling and simulation environment was proposed by the team at the Osaka University already in 1993. Therefore, we can safely assume that the idea of digital twins as the counterparts for the real processes has been around for several decades. Nowadays, more and more companies are drawn to the idea of digital twin. Big companies like Siemens or General Electric have proposed to use digital twins to build the entire production lines in the digital space or to digitize the product's entire life cycle from its design throughout its operation. All this is done in the pursuit of improving performance, reducing costs and energy consumption, predicting outages and maintenance of the assets. So in a broader sense, digital twin can be seen as an advanced modeling and simulation environment. What are the characteristics of the digital twin application? 
First of all, digital twin should encompass the product's entire life cycle, from its design throughout its operation. Therefore, digital twin often starts with a computer-aided design model. Multiphysics lies in the core of digital representation, and it is responsible for describing the mechanics of various processes. Physical models and their derived simulations are further validated by the actual sensor measurements. The real sensor measurements, they are acquired as a time series, and they are, at one hand, used to validate the results of physical models, and on the other hand, they are helpful for in-situ system monitoring and for building machine learning models, such as predictive maintenance. So let us consider these characteristics on an example of a digital twin for a Francis turbine. This type of turbine is commonly used in hydropower plants. Digital twin for a Francis turbine can be useful for helping uh, for building a health management system. Such system can help predicting wear and tear of various components. So when turbine is being operated, various flow conditions are introduced. These conditions result in various pressures and vibrations on the components. To start with building a digital twin of a turbine, we will firstly build a 3D geometrical model of various components such as runners or guide vanes. And these models are lie in the basis for flow simulations. These simulations are computed using the tools of computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis. The simulation results are further validated by the actual sensor measurements and are further used in predicting the lifetime or in building the predictive maintenance models. As we can see from the described example, to build a comprehensive digital tool, we uh, digital twin, we basically need the tools from two technological domains. First technological domain includes the tools of engineering, engineering computational tools, such as computational fluid dynamics or finite element analysis. The second technological domain is ICT, and its tools are responsible for the data flow between the physical and digital counterparts. In our example, we had, for instance, sensor installed in the turbine or in the building. We also needed to build an infrastructure to process the sensor measurements to a remote location where the sensor measurements are analyzed and are being used for modeling. Real-time sensor measurements are collected as time series and help in validating the physical models, analyze the correlation between various parameters, build machine learning models, and assist with systems in situ monitoring. To continue with more detailed examples of the digital twins for rotating equipment, such as compressors, I pass over to Florian. Yeah, thank you very much, Anastasia. This is a perfect bridge to, to our use case or the use cases that I have brought with me also today. And very much our at industrial analytics, our philosophy, our idea of digital twins lies within this core of the physical correlations uh, mapped in a virtual representation um, of reality, basically. And this is what we're focusing on very much as well as company to include this engineering knowledge that we have gathered from a long experience working in the field um, in industrial plants, for instance, um, into our digital twins. And I brought here uh, a first example of one of our first assets that we were monitoring, that we were uh, building also. This is a four-stage piston reciprocating um, compressor. And you see the different uh, compressor stages in which gas is compressed in. And then you have different other components that are there. We started with this digital twin with only a few sensor tags that we got. But based on the physical correlations and on physical principles such as thermodynamics, as you as you mentioned also, Anastasia, we could we would we are able to basically calculate values that are of the other components and therefore bring the digital twin together, even though we don't have that many sensor tags at hand. And yeah, this is basically how we build our, our digital twin. The fundament is lies in this kind of like representation of the physical components. And then we have the monitoring and the data model. And we build this together up in, in as I said, in this kind of hybrid modeling approach, which combines first principle models, which is a physics-based uh, data science approach and statistical models as well. And that comes together then.
in yeah in this in in the dashboard that we see now in front of us so we have the digital twin in the background this is let's say a collection of data as well but then it has to come into information it needs to transmit also what um what can be done with this information from the from the digital twin and this is what happens here so we see here an expected value that leaves the uh, no, the, we see the expected value and we see a measured value and this measured value leaves the expected value this creates an anomaly, which is a statistical calculation that happens there. And then the second step, and that's the most important, is then this event management, we call it. So how, what do I do with the information of an anomaly? How do I correlate this to certain um, physical correlations, to operational um, things that are happening? So how can I communicate also with the digital twin? And this needs to be happening in a separate dashboard, let's say. So in that sense, also the AI learns from from operators and uh, learns from the people that are working with them as well. So here we see also, again, this kind of human machine connection needs to be very much there in order to bring the value to uh, to the digital twins and to the services that we are connect with it. And, and then this is how we built this kind of, um, yeah, also enable the predictive maintenance strategies for the people wanting to use a digital twin. Um, yeah, as already said by Stefan, I to us uh, an, a train twin case basically or a digital representation of a train let's say um and a little bit how we do this or how we see it in uh, in, in industrial analytics as well and we're talking about predictive maintenance but what does it actually bring us um, so I brought here three different types of strategies of maintenance. So there's the preventive maintenance, there's the predictive maintenance, and the reactive maintenance. And on the on the y-axis, we see the costs, and on the x-axis, we see the number of failures. So if we look at preventive maintenance, so a cyclical um, maintenance of a train, so let's say every three months at a certain parameter of operation, a certain component of a train is changed. No matter the where of the, the component, it is changed due to the strategy of preventive maintenance. That, of course, um, yeah, the losing part here is the remaining useful lifetime of the spare part, actually. If we then go to the other direction, uh, reactive uh, maintenance, this is only, I, maintenance is only done when certain components are failing. Of course, this has then a high repair cost compared to the preventive cost, relatively low. And um, if we bring this together now to the predictive maintenance, so we predict the the health of the of a certain component. So we can say uh, we can say through calculations when and at what certain uh, time um, the component fails. Maintenance can be scheduled accordingly. Maintenance cycles can be prolonged so that the spare part remaining used for lifetime is efficiently used, but at the same time, not too much uh, changed in advance. So we also there create some sort of a resource efficiency that comes out of this. And this, of course, translates into a cost saving and the cost efficiency of the predictive maintenance as well. And uh, yeah, that's that's basically um how how we work uh, or what is the what lies at the core at the value of the predictive maintenance here we have um this is now let's say com um, translating what i have previously to uh, talked about which is the compressor here we have the train so similar as we we've, as i said in the beginning our at the core lies the physical correlation of the digital twin so the digital twin needs to represent the virtual uh, virtually the reality and how uh, components are working together here especially in the it is important to note that a train consists of a myriad of different uh, components and they all play together. They all have a, come together in di different systems, but they also have to work together in order to make this kind of rolling entity, the rolling stock actually um, yeah, uh, functional. And so in that sense, also, we are trying to represent a, a train always in this part. So there's a different smaller digital tw twins, if you want to, so, uh, that are coming together on one big uh, platform and some sort of create some sort of an idea on how uh, how these how these digital twins come together. So an all encompassing uh, digital twin is created with this. And um, Exactly. And another important part of the of the of a digital representation is, of course, and especially in trains, the data connectivity. So how do we actually get data from the train on board of the system into a cloud or an on-premise on-premise system? So 
our general overview or how we how we see a structure of this possible uh, we can see here on the left side we, we see what happens on board so we have a train we have different sensors and of course we have an edge device very important also in the case for trains and this edge device has to um yeah yeah, gather data and um, pre-process this data also in order to be in the right package to be sent to the agnostic platforms, let's say. Um, we are also working very much on our edge analytics and software that uh, compresses also data in that sense. And then on this agnostic platform um, where data is uh, transferred to via, for instance, open protocols such as OPC UA, um, there, then the analytics can access this data and can actually do the digital twinning, can also do the, the analytics that have to run in, in the background and then have to translate the incoming data into information that come back to, to maintenance workshops, for instance. And um, exactly. And this is what the analytics then on the server provide, the analytical work, let's say. Um, yeah, there comes the my last slide already. And then how does it look? How does the, the, the digital twin of the train then actually come together? As I said, again, the dashboard comes then into place, which is always important to then showcase uh, events, to aggregate uh, events, annotate events as well. And also, and this comes back to what I said in the beginning also, to learn from the operator, especially in the, in the trains. There's a lot of um, operational excellence within maintenance workshops with the operators of trains where certain events are happening that can that need to be labeled, that need to be added or enriched with knowledge. And this can then happen and there can be translated into an ERP system, for example, also into SAP, it can give direct work orders and give this kind of like vision of the train of the future to, to be, um, yeah, by itself to to before even the train arrives in the workshop in the maintenance workshop um maintenance personnel knows which needs to be changed with parts and what is exactly the the analysis of the failures are done beforehand basically yeah and with this i give back to to stefan and our call to action thank you very much Rora. but before we come to the call to action um i would like uh to uh, come to some conclusions. Um, we've seen some kind of really impressive examples uh, to get some ideas of what problems digital twins can help us to solve already now or, or already also in the future maybe. Uh, but I'd like to point out um, or sum summon some of the following points that uh, creating digital twins um, needs certainly a lot of domain know-how. Um, so it will not work without the help of mechanical or electrical engineers, physicists, or even doctors uh, when it comes to health issues, for example. Uh, but together with experts in AI, um, uh, they will be able to create deep insights and also discover ideally new correlations that were previously unknown. And if we look at the sensor data, uh, we will uh, be facing many of the typical challenges uh, there are. So there might be fast growing data, for example, uh, or for example, huge data volumes. Uh, Rowan talked about myriad of sensors and of course they create terabytes, petabytes of data. Uh, in some cases uh, also uh, the data will be of very high resolution if we think about the hydropower plant example of uh, Anastasia. Um, and if we think uh, about uh, functionality itself, um, we need to be able to travel in time uh, to validate our algorithms. So we want to know uh, later on uh, what kind of data uh, was digested by an algorithm. So it created this or that example, um, or maybe uh, we need to validate the data itself. So look for implausible data or outliers or filling gaps, for example. Uh, and in some cases, uh, it's uh, also very important to resample, um, get to the same uh, unit, same increment, and harmonize the data so that we are finally able to correlate it, which is uh, the provision for any kind of algorithm ex uh, um, exactly. So, so we see that there's a lot of uh, know-how involved, and, and therefore, uh, before we come to the Q&A session, and I see already some questions coming in, uh, we would like to offer our expertise for your use cases. And therefore, Vera, please start our call to action now. Digital twins have a lot to offer in any industry that is constantly producing data. Together, let's unleash the potential of cloud computing together with artificial intelligence, creating transparency for your specific use case. 
In order to make this as straightforward as possible, we have created an efficient process to work out the clear proof of value. Within a few hours, we will show you hands-on how to work on a use case solving challenges in either speed and volume or functionality. Get in touch with us at tsmlab at hacom.at to check out our proof of value program. If you are looking for a strategic partner to help you build out a digital twin of your system to boost your operational productivity, Industrial Analytics' powerful analytics services and dashboard can help you understand your machinery condition in no time. Florian is your first point of contact at Industrial Analytics and he is very much looking forward to hearing from you. Now, let's start answering some questions. And as always, back to you, Stefan. So, thank you to my digital twin. <laughs> and now, um, starting the q and I, I would like to come to the question that we got in advance. And the question was, how do you currently settle up UPC UA service, for example, from the largest main consumers in the factory, together with the customer to provide the data to customers in the energy sector? Um, Florian, may I yeah. ask this one to you? Yeah, exactly. Thank you for the for the question already beforehand. Um, exactly. So OPC UA is an open data protocol which was made by the OPC Foundation, and the unified architecture really is what it is about. Also, and by now, most of the process um, monitoring systems that are used on on huge plants, let's say from ABB, Siemens to Osisoft Pi Vision, they all hold possibilities of uh, modular uh, OPC um, add-ons, if you want so. So these kind of modular um, packages can be added to the, to the control systems and can therefore create this OPC UA servers, which are completely, um, yeah, you can you can define completely by your on your own, which kind of, um, prerequisites are given, what kind of data can be shared with third parties. Of course, it is super important to build up these, these servers because more and more external companies also help you to manage data as well in that sense. And then the um, we, we then access these OPC UA servers with our OPC UA client as well, and then share uh, this this uh, this data that is then is given to us, let's say. But there are other possibilities as well. I mean, I know from Hacom definitely that there is also possibilities via REST API, for instance. But Stefan, you you can yeah yeah exactly exactly that that's our uh, interfaces that we provide. We provide a REST API uh, to ingest the data so that you can have a, a repository where all the data resides that comes from the digital twins. And uh, also, again, by REST API, you can uh, then consume the data and you can, like many of our clients do, uh, connect and harmonize this data with the other data that, that already exists. Um, so you use our technology as kind of a data hub and uh, combine data coming from digital twins and other sources. Um, so, so that's basically how, how we, we uh, look at it. Um, another one I see. Uh, question, what about Apache Kafka? Um, maybe from, from our side, um, we support uh, consumers for streaming data. So, so again, uh, also by REST API, uh, would be able to consume the data, also validate and harmonize it on the fly without uh, persisting the data and passing it again to the stream so that the validated data would then uh, be consumed by further uh, downstream applications. Um, Florian, some some uh, comments maybe from your side. Um... Yes, I do know from, from one client that we also um, add or access the streaming through Kafka as well. I cannot go into detail with this. I'm not so familiar exactly with the, with the architecture that we used there, but definitely is possible. So we have also OPC UA, I just mentioned as one pot potential communication, uh, let's say protocol or tool, let's say, to access the streaming. But we are very open to this and have also different uh, experiences with different types of um, yeah, architectures. Thanks, Florian. I have a question that uh, um, Anastasia wanted to answer. Uh, I'll read it out. Uh, what portion of digital twins is linked uh, open data, uh, semantic web uh, ontologies? The question is two phases, your developments, digital twin developments, and other domains organizations. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very good question. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, ontology or semantic model for a particular process or domain can, of course, be a part of a digital twin. In the research project which I present in Open Hydro Power Plant, we haven't referred to an ontology, but we currently have another research project uh, in the manufacturing sector we, where we are going to start with the development of an ontology for a process. From my point of view, it is a very important part in particular because if you present a semantic model of a, of a process or a domain, it can help you uh, in deciding what kind of data you are going to collect. Because if you just, I don't know, acquire senses and collect all kinds of data, it can be very frustrating because possibility that you are not able to find any meaningful insights. But if you start with thinking about, okay, what is the knowledge of mind domain? I think it's a very good path. Mm -hmm. I hope I could answer this question. <laughs> Thank you, Anastasia. Florian, would like to add maybe something or pretty no, much it up? I think uh, Anastasia has it perfectly put on point. That's how cool. I perceive it as well. Thank you. Um, uh, what's the standard modeling software for the modeling of digital twins? Can I use them for prediction and optimization problems? Um, I would like to start with a um, with a first um, some first idea of an answer. Um, I think there are different domains as always, and, and it's not the prediction or the optimization problems. Uh, uh, we, for example, have a lot of experience in, in energy industry, and we we know how to set up uh, prediction and optimization problems. Uh, and there are some standard uh, tools out there um, that we make use of. But if it comes to other domains, um, I'm pretty sure that you use others. But there certainly are libraries out there for uh, that, that give you a very good offset for, for modeling. Um, but um, Florian, what would you, um, what, what are your ideas uh, to answer this question? Yeah, I think no, you 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 said already the right points. Um it, we have chosen basically at one point, and our architectures all built, our software is all uh, made in Julia by now. Also with the perspective on, and that's due to the edge analytics that I mentioned, this kind of um, software part that we develop for edge devices as well, that we use in order to pre-process data as well, in order to save the bandwidth or to yeah just make this uh, pre-sorting of data actually coming from sensors. And that needs to be a relatively light uh, language on, on, on this relatively small computational unit. And that's why we have chosen for this software architecture or this software language, programming language. Um, but there are certainly a lot of different ways. And it depends on the domain, it depends on what you want to achieve also. And um, maybe also what is already out there, what you already use. Um, and yeah, it's pretty open in that sense. Thank you very much. Uh, one more practical question. How do you actually start the project? <laughs> uh, Brian, I think this refers to um, what are the challenges at the beginning, maybe, yeah. or where to start? There's a yeah. lot of things to do, I guess. Yeah, this, uh, I mean, uh, I could come up with a long list of challenges. There's there's plenty of challenges to, to start uh, with, uh, with a project like this. But of course, what we most of the time need is uh, historical data, um, is some sort of like a knowledge about the, the, the asset that we are modeling as well. That means there's also a, a close connection of our um, of our developers working together with uh, very yeah, asset based uh, people as well or workers in, the, in, in, in with the clients that we are having and to build the first digital twin, actually. And there it is also important to never underestimate the time it takes to build uh, an IT infrastructure structure also data connectivity a big part and then of course in the end uh, you have to take the people with you on so the human factor always always a big um, big part as well of the of the success of a project is to build or actually tools that are then used later on and uh, yeah that is that I think are great challenges yeah. I would like to add something um, from our experience. Uh, acceptance is a very big issue. Um, we, we've seen, especially, uh, we have brought projects for hydropower plants, and we set up a, basically we've, in, in a team, um, many project partners, we set up a digital twin for a hydropower plant. And uh, you need, uh, certainly, you need some acceptance because to simply apply the sensors, you need to turn off this turbine, and this costs a lot of money. So, so mm -hmm. you uh, need to get the the sea level attention and acceptance uh, in order just to um, yes conduct this 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 work, 
And um, yeah, so, so the acceptance from many parts and of the organization uh, needs to be considered and, and should be taken care of. Um, another one, are digital twins are also used for demonstrating a product before it is sold and to answer by mentioning a system, uh, a G heating system included, including a heat pump. Um, uh, certainly, I think there are some, some cases here in, in energy industry, um, uh, setting up wind farms, for example. I know that there, um, digital twins will be created to, yeah, um, yes, especially answer dimensioning issues. Florian, what, what would, you, would you like to add something? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a, a big topic as well, especially we working with um, with Infineon now as well is the heat pumps becomes a, a big part of our work as well. So heat pumps also have compressors, so that's a good mechanical add on to some extent. But uh, a heat pump, especially these these electrical uh, products that are that are moving into uh, also a decentralized energy landscape are very important to be some sort of virtually representing and also be flexible and communicative. So that is where a digital twin comes in with a lot of um, yeah potential as well to build this com completely connected digital let's say um, network of different decentralized energy assets a digital twin is a must and I think that more and more also it becomes a uh, it becomes a, a common knowledge that that yeah uh, there's a physical product but it needs to have also its digital representation and sometimes even maybe sold together or it has to go hand in hand with it as well so yeah there's very very high potential and i think there's the move already in this direction Florian, thank you very much um uh, another question uh, um, i would like to pass on to anastasia um very simple one what uh, exactly do we need the cloud for <laughs> so so um anastasia you want to to, <laughs> to comment on that <laughs> uh, yes i uh, can so in general, you can, of course, create a database where you collect very heterogeneous data on premises or your in-house uh, server. But uh, one of the advantages of the cloud is that you can scale up, scale up your database. Sometimes it is very difficult from the beginning to plan, for instance, how much storage you would actually need. And of course, for instance, during the live operation, your amount of data is going to grow. So with the cloud, there is some flexibility in scaling up the resources. Yep. Yes, I think that pretty much wraps it up. But also like to add um, in our cloud, cloud platform, we we support this uh, elasticity that the hyperscaler um, offers. So you can scale up in terms of uh, virtual CPUs or database transaction units. And, and this can be done very easily and you can scale up, but also down. So it, makes perfectly sense so to use the cloud for, for creating digital twins. Um, I see we are already a bit over time. Um, so uh, I would like to stop here with the official uh, part of our webinar. Uh, but for those who have time, please stay. Uh, we will answer some more questions um, for another like 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, I see still questions coming in. So please stay if you like. Um, and please do also join next time uh, when it's again time for time series. So for those who do not stay, goodbye. Have a great springtime. And do not forget, life is a time series. So back again. Let me see. Um, you have mentioned uh, CAD, so cut in relation to digital twins. What's behind that? Um, I can answer um, on my part. Uh, uh, yes, so in the example which I demonstrated uh, in the basis of building a cut model, for once, for some parts of this turbine, were the actual technical schemas of the of the components, and some components which are very power plant specific for that part. Uh, our partner in this project, they did a three D scan, and then they reconstructed the runner and the veins. Uh, I don't know, Florian, do do you also have 
examples? Yeah, I can generally talk about the simulation capabilities of digital twins. Yeah, to for instance, the, um, the compressor that I have shown as well, we have in, in our demo as well, we have um, a digital uh, compressor that delivers the data and then we build our digital twin based on this. And this this kind of um, this came out of a simulation pro project that we were doing. So there, it was required from the from the client to before even building the the compressor, having some sort of an, a digital representation. And what we did with this was we were simulating basically also different types of fuel that was used in this uh, in these compressors, uh, fuel or uh, for instance gas types. For instance, we were there moving from gas to um, hydrogen for instance and how what what does this do to the compressor as well how does the compressor ha have to respond to this kind of different composition of gas as well and uh, there we were doing calculations and thermodynamic principles and was looking at it uh, from this perspective as well so the modeling there was also quite important or yeah it was used for this as well fun thank you very much um interesting question uh when you collect time series data, how do you detect and treat or fix broken data, gaps and outliers before feeding them uh, to an AI model? Uh, well, um, it works in a way that we uh, have this REST API that can be used to do this on the fly. So you, um, there are basically two options. One is that you fix this on the fly and uh, just create a new calculated uh, time series that will be directly used, um, or you can uh, also persist it in the cloud, for example, so that you have the original values and also the, the new values. Uh, but this can be done on the fly and our technology comes with a full set of functions that are available for doing that. Um, uh, Florian, you want yeah. to? Um, I think this is a this is a question we could discuss in detail also. I know that our developers have their, their methods as well. What I know how we how we basically um, fix missing missing data sets is exactly like this. We we basically calculate certain values that are based from, from a normal operating point into into this kind of time series in order to have a consistent band of data mm -hmm. however you keep the the original of course uh, in in a different file or in a different layer let's say that you can always access also so you can also differentiate okay this value was not there this is a calculated value this is uh, but for the for the sake of consistency and for the for the ability of machine learning algorithms to work with this data yeah then you have to do this you have to mm, yeah harmonize this data Cool. Thank you. Anastasia, something to add or did we basically... Yeah, I was about to, to add that uh, in our tool, uh, in addition to the capability of, of building this formula time series, which does some data treatment, we also have our Python API. So in there, all possible packages of Python for this task are available for you and you can then also embed them in your solution. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I think the anomalous treatment is the art in itself. Depending on the domain, there are myriads of techniques how you can do it. So Definitely. I think, yeah, here we have very good tools to do it. Yes, and if you think about forecasting, for example, there are also algorithms out there that are very robust and they can treat um, uh, such data without the need to 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 uh, treat them before. <laughs> so so yes, um, it's a lot of things that can be said and I think available within our tool sets. Um, um, another one I have, uh, uh, is it possible to use models, transformers, to augment the data to have better predictive maintenance? Might go into a similar direction, um, but um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, from my side, I also there, I would have to take this to, to our developers. I cannot mm -hmm. do this, uh, answer this question in, in detail. But of course, there's augmentation also used in, for the models, for the predictive maintenance models later on. How exactly that, that works, that would be a question for our developers. But I'm happy mm -hmm. to take always all questions with me and answer them uh, afterwards as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... How can we see use cases of digital twins that have been created for industries other than manufacturing, et cetera? Um, I've, I think we have seen some. Um, rail transport, for example, is one, I'd say, hydropower 
um, um, plant. Uh, another one that is not within manufacturing. Um, any others maybe to add? Yeah. Uh, there are plenty. So what we have also, I'm happy to give also always a demonstration on this as well. We have a whole list of different use cases that we have done already also. And uh, it is, um, also there is a broad variety, I can tell you. We have uh, chemical plants as well, where we are monitoring the whole process system, where we go into detail to certain pump systems as well. But we have also, for example, we are in in in, in, we have, um, in, in the maritime sector as well, a lot of different pumps. Uh, engines, for instance, also is a huge topic as well. Our founding history comes from NA MAN, also energy solutions. So there's also a lot of um, uh, engine uh, discussions also done, compressors. And then, of course, this, these are only the mechanical use cases. If we then go to the to the now more and more, um, um, yeah, um, electrical use cases, let's say, there's plenty of um, digital twins of um, solar power inverters, wind turbines, um, electrical engines as well, uh, charging points. There's a lot of uh, different modules, a lot of different, of course, these all have to take in different um, parameters, but yeah, there is plenty of um, use cases in that sense as well. Thank you very much. Um, there are still some some questions open, but I think with respect to our overtime, I would say we, we finish now. We will answer all the questions later on. We have a report on this and we will contact you directly. Um, and if some other questions come up, then just contact us. You have our um, coordinates. So please do not hesitate to do so. And um, then thanks again for this lively discussion, also to the panel, um, Anastasia and Florian. Uh, it was very nice having you. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks to all of you. And um, at the end, once again, don't forget, life itself is a time series. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.